and we're talking today about how do we stop at two degrees. That'll, of course, be the climate. Uh, the mission being to prevent the global climate from warming more than two degrees. Uh, I have an extremely distinguished panel with me here today. We have uh, Governor Jay Inslee of the state of Washington in the United States. We have Christiana Figueres, uh, the convener of Mission 2020, whose mission it is to, uh, to obtain peak emissions of carbon by 2020, and who is responsible for convening the United Nations Agreement in Paris around climate uh, mitigation and uh, prevention. And uh, Ficus Besma, who is CEO of Royal DSM. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to ask you, Christiana, uh, with the United States uh, extracting, potentially extracting itself from the Paris Climate Accord, uh, does the world have any hope to keep emission uh, warming to two degrees? Well, first of all, slight correction, important correction. Important, slight but important. Uh, the target of the Paris Agreement is not to keep us to two degrees, it's to keep us well below two degrees. Hmm just so that we can keep, that's you know. That's an exceedingly important. That's an exceedingly important. And in fact, to strive toward 1.5 degrees. Correct. So just, just to, you know, know I what. And, and the reason for that actually is a very important reason, right? Because if we go into a world that warms more than two degrees, the insurance industry has warned us that that is a world that is systemically uninsurable because of the destruction that would be cast upon us. So that is why we have to stay well below two degrees. We do not want to endanger the global economy. So now, if I might uh, So what does ask you this. the US government on, well, do on, on that? On, on, the, on, on our current path, we are, uh, we are likely to meet, that, meet those targets? No, we're not because the Paris Agreement never aspired to meet it with the first harvest of efforts, OK? So if you think of it, you know, we have a harvest of efforts, just like you have a harvest of grapes for the vintage of that year. Um, the vintage that we have of 2015 was never meant to keep us under two degrees. It was meant to be the first effort. And within five years, which starts actually now at the end of this year, all countries need to come together again to figure out what have they done, what has the private sector been able to contribute? What have policies contributed? Where has technology moved? Where has uh, finance shifted? And therefore, because of increased confidence, where can we go next? So the Paris Agreement will keep us well below two degrees if we keep to that pace of increasing ambition every five years. Mm -hmm. To your question about the United States. Yes. Three things that I wanted to say. Number one, it is not at all clear whether the United States will actually withdraw, because irony has it that the United States, from a legal perspective, politically they can, of course, do whatever they wish. But from a legal perspective, the first day that they would be able to withdraw is the 6th of November of 2020, which is three days after the next United Nations, uh, after the next US election. So we don't know what they're going to do on the 6th of November of 2020. Secondly, the question is, uh, the current political position of the White House, does that impact what the United States said that they would do under the Paris Agreement? Too early to tell because the fact is we don't know what the numbers are going to add up. What is fantastic is the reaction that we have had, and we'll hear more details, I'm sure, from the governor, that we have had from nine states, 300 cities, 1,000 corporations in the United States, call them the real economy versus the politics, the real economy that is actually moving with decarbonization because they know that it's good for them. And the third point that I want to make is, does the intended withdrawal or the political withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Agreement affect the world's efforts? And to that, I have to say, frankly, no. Because I have not seen one country of all of the other 194 countries who has now said, OK, because the United States is not doing its bit, then we're going to go out, in part because of the response of, uh, of the real economy of the United States, but also in part because they understand that it's good for them. China and India have already surpassed what they said that they were going to do under the Paris targets. Not because they want to save the planet, because it's good for their economy. Good economics. Good e and, and to that end, uh, it, that's what you're finding in Washington state, that uh, the state is, that, that actors in the state, cities and others are prepared to make, uh, make changes based on economics rather than politics. Uh, very much so, because what we have learned is that uh, 
acting to develop a clean energy economy actually enhances your economic productivity. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because at least in my state, which is a technologically adept, innovative state, every time there is an economic transformation, we have grown our economy. When we went from propeller planes to jets, we grew our economy. When we went from an analog system to a digital system and software, we grew our economy. And now we're going to decarbonize our economy. And that's when my state does well because we develop these new technologies. So in my state, um, uh, CNBC just listed my state as the best place to do business in the United States. And one of the reasons is because we are developing our clean energy economy like crazy. We have 90,000 jobs in my state and growing twice as fast in the clean energy economy. Jobs in the clean energy economy are growing twice as fast as the rest of our economy. And it's because we have made investments in companies that are on the cutting edge. We have uh, the Western Hemisphere's largest manufacturer of carbon fiber that goes into electric cars. We have the largest vanadium flow battery in the world that allows uh, to integrate renewable energy to the grid. We're making great solar panels in Bellingham, Washington. So you can't turn over a rock in my state without, without finding a job-creating uh, industry that is created that's going to help uh, solve this problem. So it's a positive thing your economy, for your economy. And it's not a, an accident that the best uh, economic uh, locations of, of growth in the, in the United States are those who are part of this alliance that Christiana uh, talked about. So uh, the day after President Trump made his statement uh, about Paris, uh, within a day, we'd stood up an organization called the United States Climate Alliance. So we have an alliance of 14 states in one territory. We are committed to the Paris agreements. We are all acting in, in our own way to do that. And we would be uh, the third largest economy of the world if our 14 states were one uh, nation. Now, I am not suggesting that those states become a separate nation, <laughs> uh, but we are acting, and it's not slowing us down. So actually, the message of, of Davos, I think, is, is that uh, President Trump has been a, a, a one-man parade with no one behind him, because no one has followed him out of the Paris Agreement. Actually, we've had three Republican governors join us rather than his uh, retrograde uh, effort to deny science. So the momentum is very much to continue this, this effort that came out of the Paris Agreement and, and, and well that it is. So we're very optimistic uh, about what we're doing in our state. And the, the same is true of many in the corporate world, is that not? So, Mr. Sibesma. Right. Well, let's turn to the people who cause the emission, the private sector to a large degree, or the <laughs> consumers of our products. Um, and I hope we don't need to discuss the reasons why we need to address climate change. I hope it's so obvious the signs and the issues we see already today, the people suffer today. So if we don't go into the topic of the climate skeptic people, why do we need to address, but go immediately to how do we solve it, uh, then we say we need to do three things as a private sector. We need to reduce our own emissions. We need to enable the whole supply chain to do better, and we need to advocate. Reduce our own emission, set targets, science-based. Uh, we have a carbon budget. We need to be uh, at the peak, ultimately, in 2020, 2050, neutral. Then means you need to have absolute reduction targets as the private sector. Secondly, enable. Try to uh, develop new innovations. Uh, make cars more lightweight, so less fuel, less CO2. Uh, boosting the output of solar panels. Or, let's not forget, the agricultural sector. Uh, developing new feed ingredients, we just did. Uh, reducing the emissions of cows. We call them clean cows. So um, those kind of things enable is also a possibility. And of course, then advocate. Advocate be strong. We have now 81 companies, big multinational companies, joining us in the web climate leaders who advocate clearly putting a price on carbon to stimulate all to take really tough measures and having a financial economic incentive to do that including, by the way, the investors who invest in their companies. And I think it is important to reduce our own emissions and enable and to uh, put effort in, um, in, uh, in innovation. And I think this just makes good business sense to future-proof your company. Ten years ago, I was questioned, mm -hmm. is it making profit or doing well for the world? Today, ten years later, we can show those two things can go hand in hand, at least in our company. I'm sure if you sit here in 10 years from now, <coughs> if as a company you did not address those things, mm -hmm. you don't make profit anymore and your investors will find that out. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense and the world is changing. Hmm. 
So we've got a, a, a panel here of uh, climate optimists from the, the global level, from the, the, multi, the multinational level and the local level. Uh, we've actually reached out to the great global public through our social media channels and I've got some questions here that I'll put to our panellists. If anybody in the audience would like to ans ask a question, let me know and I will come to you in a minute. Uh, this is a question for you, Christiana, and it comes from uh, Kendall Tyson in Chicago in the United States. What solutions are you working towards to solve the issue of air pollution and what innovative projects have you seen that provide people with clean and safe energy? Well, you know, it's interesting because air pollution uh, actually uh, is uh, one part of the problem. It's not, it's not everything. So if you look at fossil fuels, which have caused global warming and uh, climate change, it is the same burning of those fossil fuels that cause air pollution. But it's two different types of pollution. One is the local pollution, the local <laughs> particulates that come out of the burning of fossil fuel from our cars, from our factories, et cetera which is causing harm to the respiratory system of humans, which is why we need to move beyond that. Mm -hmm. And the same burning of the same fossil fuels is what's causing global pollution, which is different, uh, different particulates, different gases, uh, which is what's calling, causing climate change. But the source is the same. So whether you're interested in your own personal health, in your public health, if you are a political leader, or if you're in the, in the medical system, or whether you're interested in the planetary health, it's the same problem. It is putting the fossil fuel industry, thank them truly, because much of what we're enjoying today is thanks to the fossil fuel industry. So thank them for what they did in the, in the past century. But then, just like any other little old lady, put them to retirement. It is time to retire the fossil fuel industry as a whole and move toward the cleaner fuels of this century. So everything under the Paris Agreement, actually, and everything that is being done by the local governments, by state governments, by corporates, is actually moving us slowly but surely, not fast enough, away from fossil fuels, mm -hmm. which has been the bedrock of our society, into cleaner fuels that will allow us to continue our economic development, very important, but without the toxic, um, uh, toxic effects from so, fossil fuels. Uh, Fike, what would you say are the, mo when, you, when you're making decisions on behalf of, uh, of your corporation, what are the most important incentives that factor in your mind when you're thinking about making climate, uh, decisions that are climate related? <clears throat> it's what I said, by the way, I can build on what Christiana was saying about uh, putting them into retirements, uh, and she called even the fossil industry the black rock or something like that. What did you say? The, like a little old lady. Like a little old lady. <laughs> right. Thank her and, and put her in retirement. And, uh, right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and why should we or could we put them into retirement? Because there are better alternatives uh, today. Cheaper. It is a little bit the analogy with the Stone Age. I mean, why did we move out of the Stone Age? Not because we were short of stones, <laughs> but there were better alternatives. Yeah. And uh, it's not that we are short of coal, to be honest, in the world, but there are better alternatives. Or gas or oil. Or gas or oil. There are better alternatives. And uh, that is exactly what we take into consideration with our decisions. There are better alternatives to the future. There will come a price on carbon. China just started with it. Europe just withdrawing the allowances. The Americas, including Washington, are linking their systems. If you, as a company, do not see the writing on the wall, do not see that you need to address this, just from an economic perspective, uh, you have a responsibility, I believe also, but if you say it goes beyond my responsibility as a global citizen, I just take economic decisions. Imagine you do that. I go further, but imagine. Then it makes good business sense to address uh, your business in such a way you become climate proof. Uh, you reduce your own emissions because you will pay for it. Then you develop products uh, which help this world to make a step forward because you will make money of that. The new climate economy report showed clearly that we can show economic growth. We don't have to go back to old history. We can show economic growth via addressing climate change. So for me, it just made good business sense. We transformed our company. And by the way, 115 years ago, we started as a 
coal mining company. Mm. I hardly dare to say it, but that's <laughs> our history, that's 115 years ago. Now already 60, 50 years ago, we changed into a chemical company. Now 15 years ago, we changed into a life science and material science company, which we are today. So you need to adjust in order to survive. I'm a biologist. Darwin taught us. Those who will survive will those who adapt. And that's true on, on, on the local level as well. I've got a question here from Kartik in Dubai, uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Kartik asks, there's a surge in the production and consumption of electric cars, but electric cars take electricity and electricity burns fossil fuels. Uh, isn't that going to be more harmful than if we just stuck with the good old petrol Vehicles. Uh, appreciate the question. The answer is no. Uh, even with the same uh, uh, mix of generating capacity in your grid, electric cars can be at least marginally better as far as the CO2 net life cycle. Not much, but a little bit. But as the question indicates, uh, the real success of electric cars are when we can clean up our grid and when we can have sources of electricity that are not uh, CO2 sources. Now, that is well within our possibility. Today in my state, over three quarters of our grid comes from um, non-CO2 emitting sources, over three quarters. So we have a capacity to do that. Now, we're blessed with hydroelectric in my part of the world, so that's one of the reasons. But what we are founding our, finding is that we can rapidly uh, move away from fossil fuels, even for that remaining percentage. And our utilities are finding ways to do that as well. So we are closing our only remaining coal-fired plant in the state of Washington. We are moving off of, of coal-based electricity that otherwise would go into cars that comes from other states. And here in Davos, it's interesting, in the last 24 hours, I've talked to three companies that are very interested in, in starting some solar power plants and building electric ferries in Washington and state. in Washington state. So it's interesting, from Davos, we've, we're finding people who see a business case for cleaning up my grid, even for the small part that still is based on fossil fuels. So the, the rapidity of this is quite uh, amazing. We've had a 90% reduction in the cost of solar photovoltaic solar in the last eight to nine years. We have 90,000 people in my state now working in these clean energy sources to make the grid clean so the electricity is, is virtually clean when we do put it into uh, our electric cars. So there's every reason to be optimistic about this. And as I've said, my state is not the only state that is, that is achieving success in this regard. By the way, we even have three uh, Republican governors in our coalition who are trying to clean up their grids as well. And, and the reason I point this out is electric cars are a future because we have public policy leaders to understand we're going to clean up our grids so those electric cars can be very clean. And the battery technology, the development of battery technology is so rapid you just knock your socks off. The chemistry uh, improvements that are being are, are just amazing. Mm -hmm. So we ought to be optimistic about electric cars. In fact, uh, I just have an electric car that was going to be delivered tomorrow. I'm buying it used because I'm <laughs> very sort of Scottish on this. And, um, but they delivered the wrong car. So we'll be back maybe <laughs> so next week back. with a new electric car. With a new, so, so what I'm hearing is there are a, a ton of already, you know, there are existing economic incentives to make this shift. Uh, by your own admission I, I earlier. think you're also hearing very interesting from the governor is that those jurisdictions, in this case a state, that put in place these policies actually attract investment. It's not that, you know, at this point you don't no longer have to go and look for it. Those, that, those uh, companies that are in this new economy will very quickly flock toward those jurisdictions that have the policies that are providing these incentives. And those jurisdictions will be prov mm -hmm. providing more employment, better air, better, better health, better energy security. So, you know, it's, it's not just that the, the uh, renewable energy is a better investment th against fossil fuel. It's actually that there is economic, <coughs> for the entire economy, there is benefit from moving into um, the cleaner technologies. And if I may add some of these, what we are finding is, is that when you have policies that inspire uh, people getting access to electric cars and solar panels and more insulation, it attracts the manufacturers and the producer because they want to be close to their customer yep. and they want to have a, a, a market brand that is associated with a, a sustainable approach as, as you do and that's a, that's a, that's a market benefit. So uh, good behavior uh, attracts good investment. That's what we learned in the state of Washington. And in addition, 
I tell you, the investors, slowly, slowly, <laughs> but they are getting it. More and more pension funds, more and more investors, more and more insurance companies want also to future-proof their investment. And they're also scared if they have invested in the wrong things that over time they will be hurt. Mm -hmm. So they see also the writing on the wall mm -hmm. and they want to be invested in the right things. And therefore, those kind of initiatives yeah. attract mm -hmm. new investors. And that's good. You said earlier that at, at current rates, we are not on track to meet the Paris Climate Accords uh, objective of well less than two degrees. Uh, what do we have to do now, next year and 2020, to meet your mission of peak admissions? Well, now there is a challenge. There is a challenge because the fact is that the science of climate change has advanced even since 2015. And we were not aware in 2015 or 14 when we were in 15 when we were moving toward the Paris Agreement of how precipitous, how precipitous the, um, the change or the, the moment in time is up upon us when we will actually decide as a society, can we bring climate change into control or not? And the fact is that that has now been pinpointed to be the year 2020. So within two years, or three if you count the end of 2020, uh, we have to have been at the point as a global society that we have to reverse the trend that is currently still going up despite all of our optimism, despite everything that we're saying, we are not at the critical mass of reversing the global trend. We're in the transition period, but we're not reversing the trend. So we have to, within maximum three years, reverse that trend and not just flatten out our emissions, but actually begin a pretty rapid descent so that by 2050, we will be at a net zero economy. A big challenge. <laughs> so uh, how? How? Well, first of all, we are on track to have 23% of energy on the global grid be renewable by 2020. Uh, close, but uh, no cigar. Uh, we need it to be actually 30%. We are mobilizing capital. We are currently uh, coming up to $400 billion being invested every year globally into clean technologies. OK, but we need to move it to $1 trillion. We, are, we have had on, on transportation, we have had over the past uh, three to four months, the announcements of seven major companies ch in China, in Europe, and in the United States that they're moving toward the post-internal combustion engine, toward electricity, electric uh, vehicles, and each of them have given their, uh, their dates. Very good, but we would have to be seriously on track where every major city of the world, and currently we have only a few, but every major city of the world has to have had the policy already in place by 2020 that they're going to actually start either levying attacks or prohibiting the use of, uh, of polluting cars. To give you just a few examples of the many different areas in which we need much more speed. On all of them, we have traction. On all of them, we're moving in the right direction. It's the speed and scale that is a problem. So the, 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 there's a gap of 7% between where we need to be on energy, on electricity. We need another $600 billion uh, in investment in clean energy. Did you bring your energy. checkbook? <laughs> I'm, I'm ticking off the boxes here. So the question is, uh, what, uh, to, uh, you can do what you can in Washington State. Mm -hmm. uh, give us a couple of examples of what you are doing to help close these gaps. So uh, as we speak, we are attempting to pass uh, uh, America's first carbon tax, which will create a price signal uh, to spur investment and will also, importantly, uh, create about a $3 billion investment fund in my state over a biennium so that we can help consumers get access to the electric cars, so we can help businesses get access to new efficiencies to reduce CO2 emissions so that we can um, uh, help people in insulating their homes so we don't waste energy, so we can make uh, additional investments in our incredible research institutes, so we can train people in the new businesses and clean energy. So we're excited about that. I'm two weeks into my legislative session and we hope we can achieve it. We're also looking at uh, uh, avenues to have a low carbon fuel standard uh, as a potential alternative to a carbon tax or an additional one, which will essentially require the industry to give us cleaner fuels. And it's been very effective in California, and we're looking at a way to do that. 
We are in Oregon. Thank you very much under Kate Brown's tremendous leadership. We have two great uh, Governor Browns in Oregon and California. Uh, we are looking at, a, at a, essentially a clean uh, fuels mandate for the grid so that any future uh, uh, generating capacity would need to be renewable. We're also looking for additional incentives for electric car uh, usage. So we have, we have multiple avenues. All of these make sense. We're starting with a carbon charge because we believe it's the most flexible so that industries, rather than having a regulatory approach, would have a, a price signal and then they would have the flexibility of how to make the investments to actually improve CO2. So we hope that we are successful. If anyone knows a legislator in Washington state, you feel free to share your viewpoints with them. You have a First Amendment right in America to do so, and I will defend you if you would like to do so. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, here you see how the private and the public sector will work, can work hand in hand together. I mean, as a private sector, rightly so, we do not make legislation. That is up to the public sector. But as a private sector, we are a very simple sector. Hmm. We react quite instinctively hmm. on financial incentives. <laughs> and, uh, Even in your sleep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that counts for all my colleagues. <laughs> and I dream about other things. But <laughs> nevertheless, um, uh, putting a price on carbon, which is now happening in the Americas, I mean, Chile, Peru, uh, Mexico, Canada, and of the country in between Washington and California, uh, Europe, China, they all put a price on carbon right now. And the investors and the private sector is reacting very simple. If there is a financial incentive to reduce my own emissions, if there is a financial incentive to do better, better innov more innovations in this field, then they will do that. Investors will come and companies will come. So it is happening and it will happen. And therefore, the most important is, I think, to put a price on carbon. And if it's happening globally, there is also no carbon leakage of transformation of businesses move from one area to another area because you will be biting always, whatever, bitten always, whatever happens. And in the sectors, I would say look to energy, look to traffic, because those are big emission uh, providers, so to say. But I mentioned it already. Let's not forget 18% of our total emissions, our agriculture. And that maybe has to do with our meat consumption, but also how we treat our cows. And like I said, I don't know how the cows look to regulations about themselves and how but, they look uh, to their own feed, <laughs> but there are solutions. Clean cows. And uh, clean, clean cows. cows. Very good. <laughs> okay, well, this is Davos, so we keep things on time here. The number of climate skeptics on this panel is clearly none. We know, however, that there is at least one in the Congress Hall at the moment, but the message from this panel is it might not matter. Thank you for being with us until now. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. It might not matter. It might not matter.